when you increase paraxanthine versus caffeine, you see reduction in errors versus with caffeine increased errors. We're seeing improved endurance and resistance to fatigue and overall improved performance because of the things that I was mentioning. You're increasing nitric oxide, you're increasing neuroplasticity, you're increasing serotonin, dopamine, you're decreasing beta amyloid plaque. All these things that are happening, there is this afterglow period. And again, we're seeing this time effect so that like the more you use it, the better it gets. All right, so you, if you're listening, might have heard me talking in the past, uh, of recently at least, about this new energy molecule that I've been experimenting with called paraxanthine. It's both an X, P-A-R-A-X-A-N-T-H-I-N-E. It's super interesting, and although my guests on today's show will be able to explain this stuff a little bit better, it's... it it, it feels like caffeine, but it's a little bit different. Like you don't get this crash. You get a lot better focus. Uh, a lot of people, including myself, say it seems to give you more swagger and more confidence. Uh, I, you could take it late in the day and still sleep okay. It's, it's super interesting. And, uh, you know, it, it seems like energy compounds are a dime a dozen. They're obviously all over the place. You, know, you can't swing a dead cat by the tail without hitting some new energy drink or new energy capsule or supplement or patch or something like that. And frankly, I use a lot of them just because people send me this stuff and I experiment with it. Like I, I try everything at least once. Um, and I've had things like the sweaty palms and the racing heart and the crash and the poor sleep and a lot of the stuff that goes along with many of these fringe molecules that pop up. Uh, but this one, paraxanthine, is kind of like it's stuck with me. Like I like it. Um, I think that the very first person I heard about it from was one of the guests on today's show, Sean Wells, who's been on my podcast before. He's actually uh, known as one of the world's leading formulators and is a nutritional biochemist. And when I was talking with Sean, I forget, Sean, if it was on a podcast or if we were just chatting uh, offline in person, you told me about this paraxanthine stuff. And I think you you sent me like a like a beta batch, like some little capsules of it. And then later on, I met your friend Daniel, who's also on the call, Daniel Solomons. And Daniel had been working with you to figure out how to get it into a drink. So I tried the capsules, and those worked pretty well. Then I tried the drink, and that was even better. Uh, I, th I think you combined it with some stuff that you can tell us about. So long story short is this stuff's super interesting. I don't think a lot of people even know about it yet. But I wanted to to break the news about paraxanthine. So Daniel and Sean, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, thanks for having so me on. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And by the way, uh, for those of you listening in, uh, we are now doing uh, almost all of our podcasts as video podcasts. You can watch this on YouTube or you can go to the show notes. And that's going to be at bengreenfieldlife.com slash update podcast. bengreenfieldlife.com slash update podcast because the the name of this stuff that has the paraxanthine in it, this drink, is called Update. I, now that we're doing video, I should have grabbed a can and brought it down to my office, but I didn't. Going right yeah, I've, I've actually been drinking it like in the late afternoon. It's like my late afternoon pick-me-up, because I still like to have a, a cup of coffee in the morning. I don't want to double up and double fist too much. But um, anyways, ju just a, one, one other quick thing for people listening in. You're probably already familiar with Sean, because he's been on the show before, and I'll link to some of the other podcasts that we've done. But He's formulated like a thousand different supplements and foods and beverages and cosmeceuticals. He's got 25 different novel ingredients, and uh, he's, he's kind of like known as an ingredientologist, if that's an actual term. And so he basically studies this stuff in his sleep. And then Daniel has not been on the show before. Sorry, Daniel. You, you're going to have to keep up with Sean as a, as a three-peat guest. But Daniel is the, the co-founder of this company, Update. And... Um, 
he ha- he has a, a background in working to develop some pretty groundbreaking formulas. So this one amongst them. So Sean and Daniel have kind of partnered up on this thing. And uh, so we got both of them on the show. So uh, as, as is always the awkward case when I've got two guests, who wants to be the first person to explain what paraxanthine is? Uh, and I don't care if you get super scientific, but just ease us into it. Don't, don't blow too much smoke out of our ears too soon. So f- firstly, I'm glad he told you what paraxanthine was when he sent you the bag of capsules. I didn't get a warning. I was just sent a bag of capsules and told oh, really? them, you know, if you like it. <laughs> so um, that, that was my foray into paraxanthine. Um, paraxanthine is the main metabolite of caffeine. So when you consume caffeine, whether it's in a coffee, a tea, an energy drink, it's going to break down in your liver into three metabolites. Paraxanthine being the primary one, it breaks down to roughly 80%. And then you have theobromine and theophylline. And okay. What, wait, wait. So, so coffee breaks down into those three: paraxanthine, you said theobromine, exactly. and theophylline. Wait, so, when you exactly. drink a cup of coffee, you're getting all three of those. Exactly. So, okay. paraxanthine isn't something new. Um, it's not something that we should be spooked out about. Um, it's just something we haven't really known or haven't discussed before. Um, okay. Until now. If we've been drinking coffee for, I don't know, I forget what it is when that guy first fed his goats coffee beans and they got all hyped up. But I don't know if it was hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago or, or what. I'm not a coffee historian. But why didn't we really stumble across the idea of isolating this stuff until recently? That's, a, that's an amazing question and one I get asked often. I think that there's a few reasons. One... When you look at the conversion, uh, imagine caffeine, uh, if, you're, if you're listening, at, at kind of the top of this pyramid, right? And, and then there's the split, like as Daniel said, into these three metabolites of theophylline, theobromine, paraxanthine. The majority of caffeine converts into paraxanthine. So you might look okay. at this and say somewhere between 72% and 84% of caffeine is converting to paraxanthine. So why would we really need to take it? And two, yeah. when you look back mm, just 10 years ago, it was believed that paraxanthine did not occur naturally. Now, we've found many food sources of it occurring naturally now. We've done a lot of work on that. So that wasn't fully understood, and I think that held up some things, and it was just considered maybe a chemical compound. So I think it's those two things, but now we've found, we found that it occurs naturally. And here's the thing that makes this very different, that when you, one, you have fast and slow metabolizers of caffeine, looking at the CYP1A2 gene, like I'm sure a lot of your followers have mm-hmm. looked at this genetic information, and you can decide whether you are this this fast or slow metabolizer. And by the way, it gets super complex. I, I'm saying this very simply. When I've looked this up, there's actually like 43 variants of this gene. So it's not right. just fast and slow. There's medium. There's people that have yeah. deficiencies, people that have no gene. Some it, it's, it's, like, it's like muscle fibers. People hear about type 1 and type 2. And then Mm -hmm. you actually find out that you've got a whole host of slow oxidative, fast oxidative, fast glycolytic, type 1, type 2A, type 2B. So, yeah, depending with a broad brush, most people just think they're either fast coffee metabolizers or or, or slow, I should say, caffeine metabolizers. Yeah, so so here's the thing. We know there's a lot of bioindividuality at the point of caffeine. Where so much so that some people, the fast metabolizers, people say, oh, I can have coffee and go straight to sleep, right? Uh, A lot of people are like that out there. There's people that have a one and a half hour half-life for caffeine. At the opposite end of the spectrum, there's people that have, we're seeing 10 and a half, 14 in some literature. And then those people that don't even have the gene, it's like 152 hours to clear this stuff out. Hmm. But there's a lot of us many of us, that it's taking three days to eliminate caffeine from our system. And so what we're seeing with paraxanthine, if you're the fast metabolizer and you say, oh, I can have coffee and go straight to bed, you're not getting the side effects, which is great, but you're not really getting the benefits either. And on the other end of the spectrum with the slow metabolizers, those are the people that are generally in 
the hell created by caffeine where they're not getting the benefits and they're not getting and they're getting all the side effects. And so this is where there's a huge difference um, when we go to directly to paraxanthine because paraxanthine we're seeing is the majority, the lion's share of the benefits that you get from caffeine. So that conversion is the most important step. And when you're a slow metabolizer, you're stuck in what's generally a toxic state with caffeine. I mean, think about caffeine was uh, in plants generally for to be toxic to insects as like an essentially an insect repellent. You mean it was like, like, see- a, like a plant defense mechanism. Like, exactly. Like, like lectins or gluten would be. And we see theobromine, which is fairly benign in humans, but it has toxicity in cats and dogs. Theophylline is a controlled substance, right? And a bronchodilator, a ton of side effects. And so we're seeing that these molecules, except for paraxanthine, have many side effects, have greater toxicity. And this one compound that has all the benefits doesn't have the toxicity, doesn't have the side effects, you know, doesn't disrupt your sleep, doesn't give you the anxiety issues. And then we're seeing it's 50% 50% better at adenosine inhibition. Hmm. We're seeing it's 50% better at uh, dopamine. So you are getting like more of that, as you mentioned, like the swagger, the focus, the, um, you know, the, the productivity that comes with dopamine. You're also getting the, the neuroprotection that comes with dopamine. When you look at neurological uh, conditions, degeneration, such as like Parkinson's, right? But on a preclinical sense, we're seeing so many things change. We're seeing BDNF elevated, which is a, a hot term, right? Like the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, neuroplasticity. Right. We're seeing that upregulated. We're seeing serotonin uh, upregulated along with the dopamine. We're seeing uh, reduced oxidative stress. And we're seeing increased, uh, along those lines, increased glutathione and catalase. Um. Hmm. You know, we're seeing a decreased beta amyloid plaque. So now think of that as a potential mechanism for Alzheimer's. So we're we're seeing increased nitric oxide to the brain via PDE9 inhibition. So think about how not only are you getting the focus and the energy, but it's not that come at a cost type thing like caffeine's always been. This is like actually making you better. And we're actually seeing this with some early data, um, and I can't really uh, explain it all quite yet because it's okay. it's too preliminary, but we're seeing that there is a time effect, meaning like when we continue to use it, the results get better. So this yeah. is like- that, And really that, that's interesting because people will say that about like, um, I don't know, like, like Provigil, Modafinil, right? People are mm-hmm. like, oh, it's like driving a car, you take it and you eventually- kind of like learn how to operate and function better and better the longer you take it. And obviously there, there's a lot of, I, at least in my opinion, I don't know what your opinion is, Sean or Daniel. I, I think there's some dopaminergic issues with long-term use of a pretty powerful sledgehammer like modafinil compared to something like this. But wh- why would that be, you know, with, with a molecule like paraxanthine that the more you use it, the better it works versus what you'd expect with an energetic compound being that the more you use it, the more you'd need to actually feel stimulated. Well, it's not just inhibition, like, you know, this adenosine pathway. It's not just like the histamine modulation, like with uh, ProVigil or NuVigil, you know, and by the way, there is a study uh, with rodents that showed that paraxanthine outperformed ProVigil. Um, um, so, but and I'm not making any claims for humans around that. Don't, don't connect that to me, but just uh, since you brought that up. But I think the whole point of this is what I was just saying. Like I, People talk about there being no crash and there almost being like an afterglow, right? Like after the adenosine inhibition phase, and this is, by the way, a shorter acting molecule than caffeine. It's much cleaner for that reason and more consistent bio-individually, like where people can take this at five or 6 PM, have a great workout and still get great sleep. Yeah. Well, but, actually, actually, I, I don't want to like toot your horn too much, but I would, I would argue better sleep. 
Like that, that's actually what I might like. And obviously I'm doing a lot of stuff when I'm going through a, a typical series of weeks. And I would say that there were a few things that I did close to the time that I started to use parazanthine. Like I started to experiment a little bit more consistently with mouth taping and was, was doing, using a lot of different forms of, of red light in the morning, et cetera. But I mean, I, I, I can guarantee that the extent to which it increased my energy levels again when i'm using it in the late afternoon were a little bit um concerning to me when i thought about what was probably going to happen to my sleep architecture that didn't happen and my sleep scores have been consistently improving and i can't again attribute that all to the parazanthine but then the other thing you mentioned about the the afterglow effect, I mean, people talk about that with like LSD, you know, microdosing or even macrodosing with LSD. Those are the next day's amazing. And so people are, are noticing something similar with parazanthine is what you're saying? Yeah, there's a, they're not perceiving the drop off or the crash that they're used to with a, a number of these other compounds that you mentioned, these other methylxanthines, including caffeine. You know, we're seeing that because of the things that I was mentioning, you're increasing nitric oxide, you're increasing neuroplasticity, you're increasing serotonin, dopamine, you're decreasing beta amyloid plaque, all these things that are happening, there is this afterglow period. And again, we're seeing this time effect so that like the more you use it, the better it gets. And it's not just because of wakefulness, adenosine inhibition, there's so many other things going on. And you're not having the toxicity of these other compounds. You're eliminating caffeine, theobromine, uh, theophylline and their metabolites, by the way, there's mm -hmm. even more metabolites from there. So you're eliminating all that and you're having a much cleaner experience. That's one of the words we always hear is it felt so clean. You know, I hear afterglow, I hear swagger, like there's, there's a lot of interesting words that come up, but probably clean is number one. Okay. Now I, I know I'm, I'm totally ignoring you, Daniel, and asking Sean all the scientific questions, but, but just wait, we'll, we'll, we'll get to update here eventually. Cause I want to talk about this drink too. I know it goes beyond just parazanthine, but I'm curious just the, the geek in me, and I guess maybe the 0.1% of my listeners who might care about this part of things as much as I do, Sean, the potentiation of nitric oxide transmission, there's a link between that and increased dopamine release, I think. And I don't know if you can explain exactly what's going on when you take parazanthine with nitric oxide and what that has to do with dopamine, but I, I find it fascinating. Yeah, there is a link. And um, particularly with these like PDE9 com or PDE compounds, the phosphodiesterase uh, inhibition, we do see uh, in the brain in particular, the PDE9 greater nitric oxide release. And we are seeing dopamine in particular at the brain level. We haven't looked at things like gut. It would be really interesting to look at uh, gut neurotransmitters and how they're affected. But we also believe that we're seeing um, all of the neurotransmitters potentially potentiated. So that is something we're exploring. We did see uh, serotonin. We're about to look into uh, histamine, acetylcholine, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine. We want to look at all of them because like, uh, Ben, uh, you, I know you've explored and had people on that, that talk about psychedelics, which work via some of these mechanisms. And I'm not saying this has any, you know, psychedelic effect, but I am saying that with neuroplasticity enhanced and nitric oxide enhanced to your point, we do see not just dopamine increase, but potentially all of the neurotransmitters come up um, which is really interesting. So we're, we're exploring that more and that might be where there's that afterglow impact. And just like how, you know, psychedelics have like a very different impact where they potentiate all the neurotransmitters and you look at their impact on depression versus SSRIs, which work on one mechanism, one neurotransmitter don't have as strong a, of an effect. And I feel mm -hmm. like there's there's something going on here with potentiation of all of these neurotransmitters. Certainly, dopamine is is maybe the most impactful on our, you know, productivity and and you know, swagger and some of these things we talked about. But that's something that we're going to continue to explore. I can't make definitive claims around that, but just saying we're exploring that right now, and 
And there's a lot of reason to be excited for it right now. Interesting. Now, now when you look at something like, um, you know, the active component of uh, or ingredient in uh, Viagra, like sildenafil, I know that inhibits phosphodiesterase enzymes. I think it's PDE5. Five, you, yeah. you said parazantine is inhibiting PDE9. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. exactly. There's, and, there's and, different, exactly. The different numbers kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all, tissues, it's all Star Wars yeah. robots, but would, do, has, has this ever been studied for sexual performance then? Or things like even like erectile dysfunction or anything like that in males? We were reluctant to really go down that path. We're already like on a highly scrutinized path of energy. Um, and, and we do have new data coming out on a, a study that just finished on weight loss, which is a highly scrutinized area. So we, we're not going down the libido path quite yet. But, you know, uh, to be honest, there's I mean, when you're improving mood and swagger and confidence and energy and blood flow, it's, it's very possible. So, OK, uh, it's just not something we have data around yet. Got it. Now, you were the co-author of a paper, I think, almost a year ago that looked at paraxanthine relative to exercise performance. Uh, I think it was muscle mass, strength and endurance. What did you find with paraxanthine? Yeah, so we're seeing that one, um, we're not seeing nearly the, the side effects uh, when we compare that with caffeine. We're seeing that when you increase paraxanthine versus caffeine, um, you see reduction in errors versus with caffeine increased errors. We're seeing improved uh, endurance and resistance to fatigue and overall improved performance. As far as um, you know, muscle mass, that is something we're exploring right now with a strength training study, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so as far as paraxanthine goes, obviously it's got a lot going for it. And, and I think it was on the um, on the update energy drink label or, or, or somewhere in our communication back and forth. I think it was with you, Daniel. You use, you use the term infinity. Is infinity just like the branded name for paraxanthine? Yeah, it is. Infinity is the name that Sean and his colleagues, his team at ING2, um, have trademarked paraxanthine by. Okay. And, and so was it actually hard to create and patent this considering that you can get it from coffee? I mean, I'd, I'll admit I, I don't quite understand how the patent process works when you're isolating something that you can already get from a natural ingredient. But how, how exactly did you pull that off? Uh, it's, it's a few things here. And by the way, that's infinity with an EN, like infinite energy kind of thing. Um, okay. But the, the patents, um, and we have uh, many filed now, uh, there's, a, there's a number of patents that you can do. You can do compositional patents where we're combining them uh, with certain ingredients. Uh, you can do uh, utility or use patents around like how you use these things, like let's say for muscle mass or for endurance or whatever. And then there can be synthesis patents. And with paraxanthine infinity, um, you can potentially convert some of it from the caffeine that you would consume in coffee, but the amounts of pure paraxanthine that are in coffee, chocolate, some of these, uh, you know, tea compounds is extremely low, like hundreds okay. of a percentage point. So you're not going to get appreciable pure paraxanthine. And the problem is you're going to be getting the caffeine the theobromine, the theophylline, their metabolites, all of that going on in whatever caffeine source you're you're getting, whether it's natural or synthetic. Uh, so you're dealing with all that. And so there's the toxicity with that. There's the bioindividuality with that. There's the metabolism issues genetically with that. So it's a, just a wholly different experience. I can tell you, like, it. people may think, oh, I've probably experienced this before since I've had caffeine. No, <laughs> I can promise you it's a very different experience. And you know, yeah. that's been like, you can speak yeah. to this too. Now, what would, what would happen uh, if you were to take paraxanthine like in capsular form? I don't, I don't even know where to get the capsules. All I had was just like that unlabeled bottle of, of little white capsules that you handed me, which uh, I, I, um, uh, un unlike Daniel, I knew what I was taking when I took it, but I, uh, I didn't, um, I, I, I didn't combine it with coffee. But what would happen if you took paraxanthine like capsules along with coffee? Yeah. So that's like, 
uh, taking your pure water and then adding some dirty water to it. I mean, what we're seeing in um, multiple studies that we have now is that there's actually a kind of converse or negative effect when you take the, uh, the two compounds together. And what may be happening is that you're actually preventing the caffeine from being uh, converted into paraxanthine, you may be pushing the pathway back. And this is, you know, theoretical, but we haven't explored this part, but we show the negative performance, both mentally and physically when you co-administer, but you may be pushing things towards that theophylline and theobromine um, versus the conversion of caffeine to paraxanthine by stacking the two together. That's mm. a theory I potentially have. Okay. Got it. Got it. It'd be like, um, taking, I know, I know some people, uh, will take amino acids and then take like a sleep supplement at the same time. And apparently it competes for tryptophan and you don't get quite as sleepy if you take the amino acids with a sleep supplement. I've, I've heard some people report that before. So it sounds kind of similar. So you wouldn't want to take this with coffee, but you guys have obviously looked into other stuff that you could stack it with because you've, you've got it now in a drink and maybe Daniel, you can tell us a little bit more about this drink, but it's not just paraxanthine. It's kind of like this, this whopping stack of different nootropics. I, you know, there's a list list of them that you have in there. So tell me about update this drink that has paraxanthine in it and what exactly you guys wound up doing with that. Totally. So the whole premise behind update was we live in this world and people are still drinking Red Bulls and monsters and rock stars. And mm. to us, that never really made sense, right? Sometimes with vodka, by the way, which apparently is, is very <laughs> frowned upon in the nightclub industry now because of issues with, uh, I, I think, like strokes and heart attacks and things like that. But I've always thought it interesting that you can still get a, uh, you can get an espresso martini at the average fancy cocktail bar, and yet uh, Red Bull and vodka is now frowned upon. You just have to do it with with coffee and espresso and vodka instead at a fancy restaurant. But anyways, we digress. Exactly. Go ahead. It's just a pig with lipsticks. And I think yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, when you think about energy drinks, it's always been that way. You know, Red Bull was caffeine plus sugar. Monster came along a few years later with more caffeine and more sugar. Then Celsius and Bang and all these other drinks come with more caffeine. And they start to use chemical sweeteners like sucralose and aspartame. And that never resonated with us. Um, you know, the, the idea of consuming a copious amount of caffeine in a 16 ounce can branded like something you would be embarrassed to walk around with, you know, was not something that I would ever touch. Uh, no one I knew would ever really touch that either. Um, but we all wanted energy and we also all want to cut down on our caffeine consumption and stop drinking, you know, a ton of coffee all day. And so that's when the idea came to really, you know, see if we could create an energy drink but instead of using caffeine as a stimulant, use nootropics. And then after a lot of, uh, how should I say, experimenting on my kitchen counter, ordering ingredients from Amazon, um, not being particularly successful at formulating a drink myself, uh, that's when I reached out to Sean. Um, I'd actually heard about him on one of your earlier podcasts that you guys did together. Okay. And so I reached out to him, thought, you know, if anyone can help me create this drink, it's going to be Sean. Um, and, uh, that's when, you know, we began our three year journey working out how to formulate a new energy drink, not using caffeine as a stimulant, you know, trying to make it equally, if not more effective than what people are used to. So it was really important that you can't compromise on the energy or the alertness that you would get. You can't compromise on the taste and you can't compromise on, you know, the doses of other ingredients that you're putting in. We didn't want to feather dust things. And we wanted all of this in a 12 ounce can instead of a big 16 ounce can. And we didn't want to use artificial sweeteners, only natural sweeteners. And we wanted it tasting more like a uh, souped up seltzer than a full blown soda, um, right. which proved to be more of a challenge uh, than Sean had hoped. <laughs> that's for sure. This is like zero compromises, man. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, like using using sucralose makes things a whole lot easier. Using these uh, non-caloric natural sweeteners is certainly harder. And then they want it in the smaller can, like the Red Bull can. Then they wanted it to be flavored like water, you know, seltzer kind of thing, uh, and not like a fully sweetened drink. And then they wanted to use the full-dose nootropics. 
And then the larger dose of the parazanthine, the 300 milligrams, like, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> this, is, this is like next to impossible. And it, it took us a while. Uh, but the, yeah, the and that's, that's something I've learned from you, by dose. the way, Sean, is like working with flavoring agents. Cause I, you've, you've worked with a lot of people in the industry to on yeah. flavoring and it's a process like to actually go from something functional. I'm one of those guys that doesn't care that much. Like I'll just put a bunch of stuff in a blender and suck it down and drop powder straight into my mouth and not care that much about the flavor. But I know that's a concern for a lot of people. So you guys actually had to, had to test it. What is it? Mandarin, berry, peach, and, um, and lime, lime. And, and lime. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, the berry one's my favorite. Each, each one's like 15 to 20 calories. So there's not many calories at all. We can get into the actual sweeteners that you guys use shortly, but it, did it take a, a, a lot of work with these flavoring agents to actually nail those four flavors? Yeah, it took about two years. <laughs> Absolutely. Because like these nootropics, as you know, Ben, you know, you and I know, like we've played with these things. And I don't know, like of all the categories of supplements, nootropics are the worst. And so across the board, a number of these ingredients are just rough to use and flavor over. Um, luckily, perizanthine is similar to caffeine in terms of uh, bitterness. It's not quite like certainly nothing like these other compounds that I used to have, the, the tecrine and dynamine. Um, so these are these are uh, tough to work with, especially given these constraints. Um, again, that kind of full 300 milligram dose, nothing is very dusted in here. Everything's uh, legitimately dosed, scientifically dosed. You know, he wanted to have the you know, the claims behind these things and the efficacy. And so there's nothing like if you're used to energy drinks, maybe the taurine is fully dosed and the caffeine is fully dosed, which are both cheap, but nothing else is fully dosed. The rest of it's very dusted, the the ginseng, the, you know, these, all these other CoQ10 or whatever they put in there, you know, it's all kind of yeah. uh, window dressing. Yeah, it looks it looks good on the label though. So let let's mm -hmm. get into actually since we're talking about flavor, before we talk about these other things that you can stack perizanthine with, which I think is super interesting. What did you wind up using as your actual sweeteners, and why? We we ended up using a combination of allulose and stevia glycosides. Um, Sean can get into the weeds there, but uh, th these were you know sweeteners that he'd worked with before that our flavor house had worked with before. Um, they're, you know, non-caloric or incredibly low in calories. So all the drinks we have are between 15 and 20 calories each. Um, and they certainly don't give you that sickly sweet feeling in your mouth and taste profile that you would know to associate with like a sucralose. Yeah. Allulose is interesting. I think a lot of people see the OS and confuse it with sucralose and think that they might experience, for example, gut or, or biome issues, which is sometimes associated with sucralose. And, uh, the all allulose, from what I understand, it is something that actually can, to a certain extent, stabilize blood glucose or at least not cause a spike in blood glucose. But it's it's got a pretty similar flavor profile to sugar. Exactly. Yeah, it's a non glycemic uh, sugar and a, like very much almost like non caloric. It's uh, like uh, I think it's a quarter of a calorie per gram versus mm -hmm. four calories per gram. So uh, very low when it comes to caloric value and essentially non-glycemic as well. Yeah. I think you and I talked about this last time that I podcasted with you, Sean, but Stevia, which you guys also use in the energy drink, it's got kind of like two different forms of it. And each form of Stevia has a slightly different flavor profile and I think I don't again I don't have the can in front of me, but I I think you or Daniel were telling me you guys kind of like combine different forms of stevia. Exactly, there's a lot of technology there that's happening with the ribodiocytes. Um, when you know about Reb A, Reb D, Reb M, Reb X, they hit at different points. And when I do flavor work, we look at front end, middle end, back end, and even like post swallow, and where that mm -hmm. sweetness kind of lasts or hits. It brings out different elements of the flavor so that you can essentially lower your level of sweetness, but have it experienced more broadly. And therefore, the flavor is experienced more broadly. 
If you know, like on the opposite end of the spectrum of what I'm talking about, this is more insidious in flavor science. Like think about some of these drinks like the Mountain Dews and whatnot. They actually do research to have all the flavor hit on the front end and have it be empty on the back end so that you keep drinking it. And there's a, a really dark science around that. Hmm. Interesting. So, so what you did was you combine the two forms of stevia and then added allulose to that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Now, in, in terms of, I, I think where the sweet spot lies again, because I've tried the isolated perizanthin capsules, and then I've tried the update, and the update is it, it it's notably better in terms of the actual effects from a neural performance standpoint. Let's talk about what else is in there besides perizanthine and those two sweeteners that we talked about. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, we worked with Sean and, and a team of scientific advisors to really work out what other nootropics would complement perizanthine being the hero ingredient um, and really try to optimize that experience you get. So we've combined it with things like taurine, L-tyrosine, alpha-GPC, there's a little bit of L-theanine and a little bit of 5-HTP. And then we also use vitamin B12. And we found that that really rounded out that experience um, and kind of elevated it beyond just parazanthine. That's uh, the methylated coenzymated form of B12, uh, methylcobalamin as well. Okay, got it. So the the N, N-acetyl-L-tyrosine, am I pronouncing that the right way? N-acetyl-L-tyrosine? Yeah, you can say N-acetyl tyrosine. Or mm -hmm. N-acetyl L tyrosine. What's that do exactly? That's, uh, it's going to work synergistically as a dopamine precursor uh, with the perizanthine. So it's going to enhance that, that neurotransmission of dopamine. Um, so just working hand in hand with the perizanthine that already has the dopaminergic response. Okay, so that one's in there. And then L-theanine, which a lot of people will combine with coffee like i've recommended that in the past i think mm -hmm. you have too sean to take like mm -hmm. 100 milligrams of l-theanine when you have a cup of coffee to increase a little bit of the alpha brainwave production and stave off a little bit of the potential jitteriness of coffee especially for those slow caffeine metabolizers we're talking about but the uh the l-theanine anything special about the l-theanine that you put in there or was it just standard dose of l-theanine it's standard, but it's the it is the active isomer, the L isomer. So it is a, a really clean form. And you're right, like it does have a smoothing out effect. And what you brought up is is spot on with the the alpha brain wave that's associated more with that focus. When we think and this is the difference between perizanthine and caffeine, you're getting uh, that CNS uh, stimulation um, with both potentially, but you're with caffeine you're getting uh, all of these side effects, you're getting overstimulated, you're not getting into that alpha brainwave state. So a lot of us tend to think of like stimulation, meaning uh, now I have the energy to do well to focus, but there's an element of kind of like that yin and yang here, like where we need to be stimulated, but relaxed to have maximal focus, to be in that um, zone or flow state, right? Like we need to be both. And that's where, like, you know, having some elements of things like the perizanthine, which is less overstimulating, like, than caffeine, uh, it's more of a clean experience, but also adding some of these other things can really smooth out the whole experience and kind of give you that, that glow, that flow, that zone. You know, what we've found, which is really interesting, is we have a ton of people who are really slow metabolizers who, you know, the idea of drinking a coffee is, is torture to them. They're able to drink updates. They're able to consume parazanthine, you know, in uh, every day, um, and they get the energy that they so wanted from caffeine without having to sacrifice, without having to, you know, have a racing hard or have a crash that's going to come a few hours later or feel anxious and jittery. So, you know, that that's also something really interesting that we've found um, with, you know, parazanthine and update. Got it. And then in addition to the tyrosine, the perizanthine, the theanine that we talked about, the vitamin B12, you have taurine in there. And that, that one's kind of, you know, a, a darling of the energy drink industry, it seems, because it, it actually does work pretty well. It, it has a calming effect, in my opinion, a little bit similar 
to theanine, but it's also got that neuroprotective effect for when you're you know pushing down the gas pedals on the brain. And then um, you, there's 5-HTP in there also, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a precursor to serotonin. Uh, and again, we're seeing, at least on the preclinical level, serotonin uh, upregulated. And again, we're, we're exploring more of these neurotransmitters, but there's an effect on, on that uplifting of mood that is just enhanced even further that we already see with perizanthine. So this is, it's a really, as you know, Ben, this is a, a very experiential compound and then an even more experiential drink with perizanthine maximized at, at 300 milligrams and then to have all these other nootropics in there. I mean, to say this could replace your morning coffee is an understatement. I mean, this can change your day pretty dramatically, change your your mood, your outlook, your productivity, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, explain to me what you think is going on in terms of the fact that you can take it later on in the day and still be able to sleep. Is it because what you mentioned about it not actually blocking the adenosine receptors like caffeine does or is it something else? Well, exactly. So I, it's twofold. One, it's a shorter, maybe I'll go threefold. So it's a shorter half-life and a more consistent half-life. Uh, that's really important. And then you're not getting the the toxic compounds in there that your body's having to deal with. And then lastly, we're getting all of these beneficial side effects, if you will, again, with the nitric oxide, the, the BDNF, the, um, you know, the glutathione and catalase being upregulated. These are powerful antioxidants, um, you know, across the board, the dopamine, the serotonin, uh, the reduced amyloid plaque. I mean, what we're we're also exploring, like maybe this is potentially protective for things like TBIs, like hmm. you know, both prophylactically, meaning preventative, or therapeutically, meaning after an injury happens, that maybe this compound could be powerful for that for all those reasons. So, I think that's why we're seeing not only people uh, get a more consistent experience be able to sleep better. And then to your point, Ben, we're actually seeing not only people sleep better than caffeine, and I don't have data on this. This is just anecdotal feedback from a number of people so far. So don't quote me on this, but we're exploring this too. We're seeing HRVs from people wearing wearables improve over baseline. Meaning Mm -hmm. like when people aren't even using caffeine or perizanthine, when they're using perizanthine, it's better your sleep is actually better. Interesting. Now, again, we need to explore that more, but it could be if that's happening because of all of these other benefits to the brain. So do you think that if if I have, so I, I've got a couple boxes of cans of this stuff out in my garage, so I've got some to play with. Do you think that if I were to choose one time a day to drink it, it would be better in the morning or is this more like an afternoon thing or you think it matters that much? It's a great question. I think it's just like out of like your need, like whether you wake up well, get moving well, like feel like energized in the mornings. If you're someone who sleeps well, then maybe it is better if you do struggle, like you're saying, like kind of that uh, afternoon lull, like a lot of people have, then it could be powerful there. Um, For me, I tend to work out early in the morning and I get up when it's still dark out and I'm one of these seasonal effective people that just struggles when it's dark or gray. And so for me, I use my blue light and red light on the way to the gym and I take an update. Do you uh, you guys look at anything related to packaging? Because I I just know somebody's going to ask, like, what's in the can? Like, are there metals? Because it is a can. You know, anything along those lines? Um, Yeah. So so on the packaging front, um, we use BP ANI cans. um, And so that's kind of like the standard these days. The safest cans you can be using. We buy them from the largest can manufacturers. and, uh, you know, in terms of the rest of the packaging, you know, it's a can with an, you know, with a plastic sleeve on it right now. Um, and, uh, the sleeve obviously is not penetrating. Okay. Got it. Got it. So I'm just curious for both of you guys, you're obviously interested in brain performance and nootropics and, you know, 
cognition in general, especially having developed this, are you doing anything that would be, I guess, considered kind of tech from a biohacking standpoint that you pair with your use of something like this? Because there's everything from like, you know, light sound stimulation to PEMF to, you know, different forms of brain training. Do you guys have anything that you're really into right now that you think would be interesting for the listeners when it comes to things you could stack with paraxanthine or with this update drink or things that that you're just doing independently that you find to be pretty useful for your own cognitive performance? Um, I mean, I'll tell you right now, like I've I've uh, microdosed um, in the past. And again, I don't want to like, like put like this next to that and say this is that and whatever. But the benefits of microdosing would be things like um, neuroplasticity, enhanced performance and focus without stimulation, you know, those kinds of things. For me, I've put aside uh, microdosing and, you know, this is where I've focused. And like I said, my stack on the way to the gym is, is using, um, a small panel, um, uh, from this company, uh, light path. And, um, and it has the blue and red light at the same time. And I'm putting it, um, you know, by my photoreceptors, which like corner of my eye and, and ear. And, um, Wait, what what did you say it's called? What's the uh, what's the company? Light Path. I really Light like Path. their panels. Huh. Yeah, it's it's a small portable one, and I travel so much that I really like it. And the fact that it has the combined uh, blue and red, I really like it because I again like red light's awesome. But I'm someone who gets very depressed and blue, like when it's you know gray or when I wake up and trying to go to the gym, especially in the winter and it's dark out. Yeah. So for me, like it's, that's been a game changer. And then kind of like waking up my system with, with the update on the way to the gym. I mean, I just did this this morning. Like it's, it's a game changer for me because I work out pretty early in the morning. Hmm. Yeah. It's kind of interesting you say that Sean, cause I have a similar strategy, even though I don't go to the gym when it's dark, I usually go do my workout, um, you know, sometimes in the late afternoon or early evening. And then sometimes around like eight thirty. 9 a.m. or so. So I'm up for a few hours before I actually exercise. But I find the same thing because I flip on the red lights in my office to do work. I have a couple of these juve panels. Mm -hmm. And for me, as far as wakefulness goes, it's not quite enough. And a lot of times I'll put on the red light for like the first 20 minutes or so of the day to kind of ease myself into light. And then I've got essentially one of these boxes that would be very similar to what you get for seasonal affective disorder that I then flip on. So I've got the very, very bright lights going on along with the red lights, like a combination of blue and red. And I think that people who who are maybe wanting the best of both worlds to experiment with red and blue light in the morning, it actually is pretty useful. I think the one I have, it's got it's a e, EV, EV Y light. It's like a 40, 40 hertz signal light that's very stimulating. And so I just flip that one on in the office at the same time as or right after the red lights. How about you, Daniel? You using any type of tech for your brain? Uh, mostly update, quite frankly. Um, that's not that's not tech, know, dude. I'm, that's uh, that's nutrition. That, that, that's nutrition. Um, but but that would be it, really. That, that's kind of my go-to. Yeah. Um, anything else that you guys consider right now in your own protocols to be? Something that that you kind of stand by in your routine, um, and it doesn't have to be brain related. Anything that you're excited about right now that's a part of your routine that that you pair with update, or that's just something that's making you a better person on the daily. Uh, f from my point of view, uh, I used to be a huge coffee drinker. Um, I would drink five cups of coffee a day, and you know the price of coffee also just continuing to rise. And for me, what I've found is I'm now drinking maybe one cup of coffee in the morning because I want a hot drink and it happens to cool down faster than tea for some reason. Um, and then I'll have an update, you know, mid morning or, or early afternoon. And for me, I've been able to really reduce my caffeine consumption, which I feel better about. Um, my body is telling me that I'm, you know, physically feeling better as well. Um, you know, I'm not getting like stomach aches in the afternoon, not getting the sweaty palms. When, you know, I'm trying to work and, uh, and I also don't get any headaches if I don't drink update for a few days. Um, so for me, that's really, 
been my so, biggest change. Yeah. So for you, it's pretty much 100, 100% update. That's all you do. Exactly. Just morning, afternoon, evening, all update. Anything for you, Sean, besides the, the blue combined with the red light on your way to the gym? Yeah, I've been exploring doing infrared light uh, and combining that, knowing that there's that mitochondrial biogenesis and uh, reduced dysfunction and kind of uh, ramping up mitochondrial functionality um, with actually at the same time, very high dose niacin. NMN, yeah. NR, you know, you don't get the flush. And niacin, I actually feel, is the most potent NAD activator. Now, at 500 milligrams twice a day, it's you're going to get pretty intense paresthesis, that tingling uh, effect. Yeah. And some people don't like it, okay? And I know that. And for 45 minutes, it's kind of itchy, burning-looking skin. But I've gotten used to it. Um, and I've been stacking that with going into the, the sauna and I feel like the blood flow, the paresthesis, the tingling, the activating of the nervous system, especially superficially, is actually going to enhance the impact at that superficial level of the infrared light and all of that spectra that's penetrating my skin. So I feel like I'm exploring this uh, synergistic idea of, of using the niacin along with the sauna yeah it's interesting there's a uh, are you familiar with uh, dr nathan bryan does a lot of research on nitric oxide no and you, you should look at him he's, he's got some some cool products he has one called uh i think it's n101 it's a nitric oxide lozenge and i've actually tested mm -hmm. it they they make these little mouse strips you can use to uh, yes, see yes, how I've much nitric that. oxide you're actually producing shockingly with the use of uh, either mouthwash or any fluoridated compounds like fluoridated toothpaste, your ability to convert, uh, I believe it's nitrates into nitric oxide uh, in the mouth is significantly decreased. And you won't see these strips light up that much at all, even if you're using nitric oxide or, or even like niacin or something like that, and you don't have the stuff in your mouth to allow for the conversion if it's like an oral nitric oxide or niacin type of supplement. But anyways, he's got these, uh, these nitric oxide lozenges and similar to you, I get a lot of the flushing. If I take, you know, niacin prior to a sauna, even though I've used that protocol before the high dose niacin with the sauna, it's a popular, uh, detoxification protocol. I forget who made it popular. It's a, uh, another doctor I'm blanking on his name, but anyways, the, uh, nitric oxide lozenges, I actually like those. They give me a little bit of a similar feeling as doing the niacin without the flush. So yeah, I've you know, done I, those before too, and and like those as well. I I didn't know that was the the researcher attached to that, but yeah, those yeah. are those are great. And yeah, you bring up a great point, by the way, with the uh, um, mouthwash in particular. That you know, if you're someone that's battling ED or has uh, troubles with blood flow or um, certainly cardiovascular issues, be very careful with mouthwash. It's it's yeah. crazy uh, that it's even out there given this data. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is also interesting that what you say about nice and I'm hearing that a lot more from a lot of people, how good they feel using nice and sometimes even more than, than like NR, NMN or NAD. Probably the two things I've heard, cause I talked to a lot of people, obviously on the podcast and just you know, via texts and phone calls and things like that. Two things that, that have come up, you know, this beyond paraxanthine. Uh, one is slightly higher dose niacin. And then the other one is slightly higher dose uh, iodine, which might be a topic for another day. But there's a lot of people who are feeling pretty good by adding, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say higher dose, but by by supplementing with iodine to a certain extent. So, yeah. Yeah, two, for sure. Two interesting things. Sure, have you done much uh, of that with so iodine? I have. Uh, a friend of mine, I think you had him on the show, uh, Barton Scott. Uh, has some of those um, those nano m minerals, and I've used his product, and I've seen pretty good benefits. And as you know, salt in particular used to be iodized, and and now we're not getting much iodine in our diet anymore. Um, you know, especially if you're not eating, um, you know, sea uh, minerals, algae, uh, seaweed, you know, those kinds of things. You're not getting much iodine in your diet. Um, so absolutely there can be thyroid issues and certainly if you turn that on, if that's been off for you for a long time, you are going to see, feel night and day different. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, for people listening in, uh, I don't know if that podcast will have been released before this one comes out. I think it probably will have been, but I interviewed Dr. Leland Stillman, a really cool doctor. He flew out to my house and we went on a long walk and talked, uh, amongst other things, quite a bit about iodine. So take a listen to that one if you want to wrap your head a little bit more around the iodine piece. Uh, And in the meantime, um, I know that Daniel and Sean have a discount for us going for update. For those of you who want to try it, how could you not after listening to this? Um, yeah, I'm serious. It actually does work really well, and I'm I'm loving it. Uh, you you can go to well, you can go to the show notes if you just want to dig into some of the research that I'll post there and my other podcasts I've done with Sean. That's at bengreenfieldlife.com/slash update podcast. That's bengreenfieldlife.com/slash update podcast. And then also, if you just go to bengreenfieldlife.com/slash update drink, I think is what it is. Bengreenfieldlife.com/slash update drink. There's a discount code and it's Ben, and that'll save you 10% off of any of the flavors or the cases of update. I recommend you try all four, although my favorite is the blue one. It's um, the blue one's berry, right? I think. Yeah, mm-hmm. the blue one's berry. Yeah, yeah, that's my favorite. So, well, you guys Which did a really great job with this one. What's that? Are you bought in? Which one's your favorite? Mine's actually peach. I'm curious. My, my favorite's Mandarin. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well. All right, that's interesting. Not right. not to be used as a cocktail mixer, folks. You you heard it here. Yeah, the taurine exactly. and all that other stuff doesn't mix too well with with vodka, etc. We can talk about mocktails later on. It that my my go to for cocktails right now, if I want a a cocktail alternative, is just the um the one three butane dial, the ketone esters like uh, mm-hmm. ketone aid. They've got they've got speaking of canned drinks, they have like a gin and tonic. They got ginger mule. They've got a um. What else? A a, uh, a new pina colada flavor. So in the evenings, if I want to do like a, a a canned drink for relaxation, those things are pretty bomb. I don't know if you guys have experimented much with ketones as a cocktail alternative, but yeah, uh, I, they I, do the trick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. They're great. All right. Well, we're running out of time. So again, folks, uh, bengreenfieldlife.com slash update podcast is where the show notes are. The drink, if you want to grab some, is at bengreenfieldlife.com slash update drink. If you do, uh, you can use 10% discount code Ben. And I also would love to hear what you think if you try this stuff. Uh, because again, not a lot of people know about it yet. And I think it's going to kind of take the world by storm. Uh, everybody I've given a can to is just absolutely loved it. Even people who just don't like energy drinks in general have really dug this stuff. So, uh, Sean, Daniel, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing this with us and for formulating a cool new thing. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much, Ben. All right, folks. Well, I'm Ben Greenfield along with Sean Wells and Daniel Solomon signing out from bengreenfieldlife.com. Have an amazing week. (laughs) 